Yeah, hi everyone. I hope you're doing well today. Before we start, I just want to announce that next Sunday, early in the morning, Australia or us in Victoria uh, go to Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time, which uh, for Annika in England, sorry about that. So the clocks change by one hour, and um, I'm not sure when uh, you go the other way in the UK. But of course, I commend you for attending the classes or participating in the classes live, even when you have to get up at 5.30 in the morning to do so during your winter. Very um, commendable. Okay, so let's do the chanting now. I wanted to mention that before I forgot. I checked. I Googled it just earlier so, so that I could tell you. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Udham saranam gachami, dhammam saranam gachami, sangham saranam gachami, dudayam bhi buddham saranam gachami, dudayam bhi dhammam saranam gachami, dudayam bhi sangham saranam gachami, Tatayam be buddham saranam gachami. Tatayam be dhammam saranam gachami. Tatayam be sangham saranam gachami. Namo buddhaya, namo dharmaya, namo sangaya. Namo buddhaya, namo dharmaya, namo sangaya. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May they be free from suffering and its causes. May they never be parted from the happiness beyond suffering. May they abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment to the near and aversion from the far. I shall cause this great compassionate Buddha, please inspire me to be able to do so. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech and mind and present clouds of every types of offerings, actual and mentally transformed. I confess all of my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in all the virtues of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until cyclic existence ends and turn the wheel of Dharma for all sentient beings. I dedicate the virtues of myself and others to the great enlightenment. However innumerable all sentient beings are about to save them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are about to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are about to master them all. However endless the Buddhist way is about to follow it completely. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Tayata um gate gate, para gate, para sum gate, bodhi soha. Tayata um gate gate, para gate, para sum gate, bodhi soha. Tayata um gate gate, para gate, para sum gate, bodhi soha. So, time for some meditation now. So get yourself in a nice, comfortable position.
And when you are ready, bring your mind inside your body. To release the tension from the body. And of course, as an effect of that, you release the tension in the mind too. Starting from the bottom of the body, from the feet, work your way all the way up to the shoulders, then down to the fingers, and then to the top of your head. So let's take a few moments to do this now. Now scan your body again to see if there's any leftover tension that you can release. Now bring your mind to the tip of your nose initially and follow the feeling of the breath as you breathe in all the way into your lungs and then back out your nose again. Breathing in and breathing out, nice and naturally. You can also add the extra technique of counting the breaths from one to ten. One in breath and one out breath is one and so on. But if you get distracted counting towards ten, then go back to one at that time. So if any thoughts arise or mental activities arise, don't cling to them, don't grasp at them, don't try to force them away or deny them, but simply let them go naturally by replacing your mind back onto your breath. And if your mind starts to become sleepy or dull, then replace your mind back onto your breath more brightly. Refocusing or replacing the mind back onto the breath is the antidote. The more we practice, the less we'll have to use the antidote because the, the longer we'll be able to concentrate for and more clearly too. So now let's practice like this in silence for a little bit.
So now we can feel very pleased with ourselves. And let's fill ourselves with universal loving kindness. Either just with the feeling of loving kindness, or you can utilize the visualization techniques of filling your whole being with white light, or if you prefer, white nectar. Fill yourself with so much loving kindness that it now overflows, it radiates outwards initially to your loved ones, family and friends, filling them with the universal loving kindness too. Actually, I can point out here that all sentient beings have at some stage in the past been our relative, our mother, our father, Friends, brothers, sisters, strangers and enemies, and even pets. So all beings, in a sense, are our friends. We are all interrelated. So now also extend this love and kindness to strangers, those people that you're indifferent towards. And also those you regard as enemies as well. May all these people be happy, have the causes of happiness, be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they be peaceful, filled with the universal love and kindness. Now let's radiate the love and kindness out distance-wise, further and further too starting around your immediate area. Now to all sentient beings, all living beings, whether they live on the land, fly through the air, or un under the land even, or in the waters, whether they're born from wombs, from eggs, from moisture, or through transformation. May they all be happy, free from suffering, and be peaceful. Extend this loving kindness that is generated in your own heart to all living beings. And now all living beings throughout your whole state or county. And other states and counties throughout your whole country. And other countries throughout the whole world. Initially those you're familiar with and have an affinity towards. And those that you are indifferent towards, as well as those that you have some sort of negative feelings towards. And to your loving kindness pervades throughout all of the countries in this world and throughout all of the waterways, the oceans and lakes and so forth. Have your loving kindness pervade to the center of the earth, the core, and to the outermost atmosphere as well. Now beyond this planet alone, throughout the whole solar system. And all of the solar systems throughout the galaxy. all of the galaxies throughout the universe until your loving kindness pervades throughout infinite space once again i'll say that's generated in your own heart your own mind now fills infinite space this infinite loving kindness now just sit in this loving kindness and realize that we're all interrelated, all interdependent, 
interconnected. All beings and all objects of the mind and physical things too are empty of independence. Empty of substance that is separate from other things. Actually, we should develop a mind like infinite space, able to perceive everything, but don't get attached to it and remain unaffected by it. And now I sit here and now to do the dedication prayer right in this present moment. Due to this merit, may I soon attain the enlightened state of the Buddha, so that I may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious bodhicitta, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And may the precious view of shunyata, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. <coughs> so. We'll continue our commentary on the eight verses of thought transformation now. We're up to verse number eight. And just about at the part that relates directly to the ultimate bodhicitta, wisdom of emptiness, the nature of reality. Okay, so we go straight into it now. I left it last week by pointing out how these verses and other teachings like this they really do make us think. They're a little bit cryptic, so we have to delve into the meaning of them more. That's one of the reasons why they are um, really thought-provoking. But also they are very deep in themselves. In, the, in their nature, they're very deep. So uh, these types of attitudes and thoughts that spoil our practice, we should try to avoid, like mentioned last week. So we should avoid self-centeredness in our practice, be more open-minded and maintain the bodhicitta intention. What did I write down just before the class? Yeah, so not be defiled by these worldly winds and um, maintain the pure intention and don't misunderstand um, these, the meaning of these verses. Instead, understand the real purpose of the practice, which is to transform the mind. Okay, so um, I'll keep reading from there and then get give a little bit of commentary along the way. Um, so it, it is in, important to ensure this does not happen so that we keep our practice pure. As you can see, these mind transformation teachings are very powerful. That's where I left it last week, okay? Very thought provoking. They really do make you think. Um, another verse that comes to mind, um, this is from the Dalai Lama's commentary, um, is this one. May I be gladdened when someone belittles me. May, and may I not take pleasure when I'm praised. If I do take pleasure in praise, then my arrogance, pride and conceit increases. Whereas if I take pleasure in criticism, then at very least I will open my eyes to my shortcomings. So we don't normally think like that, do we? Normally, when we get belittled, we don't like it, try to turn away from it. Um, and we do take pleasure in being praised. That as mentioned in this verse, when we take pleasure in being praised, our ego increases, our arrogance, our pride, our conceit increases. Whereas if we take pleasure in that criticism, um, then we at least can make ourselves improve at that time. We will take um, be considerate of that, you know, and considerate of others, others as well, and appreciate their criticism. Okay, so I'll, I'll read it again to you. May I be gladdened when someone belittles me. May I not take pleasure when I'm praised. If I do take pleasure in praise, then my arrogance, pride, and conceit increases. Whereas if I take pleasure in criticism, constructive criticism, then at very least, I will open my eyes to my shortcomings. And I'll add to that and work to improve, you know, decrease our ego, decrease our self-centeredness, increase our compassion, 
or at least help ourselves to increase our compassion and wisdom, okay? Um, then this verse, along with the eight verses of thought transformation, is indeed a very uh, powerful sentiment. You can see that, I think. It makes you think deeper, makes you look at yourself and therefore improve yourself. Um, takes your focus away from criticizing others and takes your focus away from only benefiting yourself, okay? Up to this point, we've discussed all the practices that are related to conventional, conventional or relative bodhicitta, aspirational and practical bodhicitta. The altruistic intention to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. The last two lines of verse number eight relate to the practice of cultivating ultimate bodhicitta, as mentioned before. Development of insight into the ultimate nature of reality. Okay, so uh, this verse basically it reads like this, without these practices being defiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns, by perceiving all phenomena as illusory, I will practice without grasping to release all beings from the bondage of the disturbing unsubdued mind and karma. In other words, helping living beings to be free from suffering, uprooting the cause of suffering, the ignorance uh, that leads to attachment, okay? Perceiving all living beings as well as all objects of the mind and of the body as illusory. This helps us to develop more compassion. And likewise, being more compassionate helps us to develop the conditions we need to perceive the nature of reality. Okay. Um, where am I? Okay, the generation of wisdom is part of the Bodhisattva ideal as embodied in the practice of the six perfections. As you know, the six perfections, we spent about eight or nine months on it, a little while ago now. You have the perfection of generosity, the perfection of morality, the perfection of patience, the perfection of effort or enthusiastic perseverance, the perfection of concentration. The first five all relate to the relative bodhicitta, and then the perfection of wisdom, which is the ultimate bodhicitta, and the platform or the basis for which the first five can be perfected with the perfection of wisdom, okay? Um, in addition, we should know that in general, there are two main aspects to the Buddhist path. The method, also known as compassion, relative bodhicitta, or developing relative bodhicitta, and wisdom. They must be married together, practiced together in the long, long run, okay? Both are included in the definition of enlightenment, which is the non-duality of perfected form and perfected wisdom. Form in this sense means the method, okay? The actual practice of compassion, the practice of generosity, morality, patience, effort, and concentration to realize the supreme wisdom and then unify it, perfect it with the compassion. The practice of wisdom or insight correlates with the perfection of wisdom as mentioned. The practice of skillful means or methods cor correlates with the perfection of form or the methods to be put into practice, to realize the supreme wisdom and compassion, okay? This is, sounds like a riddle sometimes, but it's not. The Buddhist path is presented within a general framework of what are called the ground or foundation, the path and the fruition. Okay, so the three aspects of the path, you could say. Uh, this can be enumerated in different ways, but this is really like the basis. So the ground, or like, I like to call foundation, is the two truths, the three natures as well, the relative and the ultimate truth, to realizing the ultimate truth, of course, but also realizing the relative truth, which of course is caused by cause and effect and conditions and so on. Okay, so this is the relative truth. In relative truth, of course, everything is empty of independence. Even the cause is empty of independence. The effect is empty of independence. And also um, then both together is emptiness as well. Okay, 
excuse me for stuttering then. <laughs> I put my teeth back in. Okay, so um, I, I do have quite strong hay fever, you could say, or allergies, which is making my mind just a little bit fuzzy at the moment, unfortunately. But that is life, as mentioned last week. The weather is uh, with the El Nino weather pattern. It tends to be more pollen through the air. The air is drier, so you don't have the humidity to kind of hold it down a little bit. So anyway, um, but you can Google that if you want to find out more about that. It's not an El Nino class. So, um, so I'll mention it again. The Buddhist path is presented within a general framework of what are called the ground, path, and fruition. Or you could say the foundation, the path, and the result of the path. Okay, so the, as mentioned, the relative and ultimate truth is the foundation or the ground, but also the three natures as taught in the Lotus Sutra, where you have the um, imputed nature, because we impute a concept and words on, on everything that we come into contact with and think about. Also the relational nature, how everything is made up, and uh, due to cause and effect and so on. Then the ultimate nature, of course, which is ultimate truth. The path is basically the four noble truths. The noble truth of suffering, the noble truth of the cause of suffering, the noble truth of the cessation of the cause of suffering, and the noble truth of the path leading to the cessation of the cause of suffering. Now, of course, the actual practice is the Eightfold Path. And all of the other related teachings, such as the six parameters or perfections, the four immeasurables, um, and so on and so forth, okay? Along this way, we also realize the aspects of renunciation, true renunciation, turning your mind to the Dharma, away from worldly things, and then realize the relative bodhicitta and eventually realize the ultimate bodhicitta, the compassion and the wisdom, all right? Um, then, of course, the fruition, the result is enlightenment, is realizing these two bodhicittas, realizing the ultimate bodhicitta and unsurpassed supreme enlightenment, anuttara samyak sambodhi or samma sambuddha, okay? The ground, understand the basic nature of reality in terms of the two levels of reality. As mentioned, the relative or conventional reality and the ultimate reality. The path. We gradually embody meditation and spiritual practice as a whole in terms of method and wisdom, such as, for instance, the six parameters, um, realizing the, the whole of the Eightfold Path, really perfecting it, okay, realizing all of the spiritual powers that we realize along the way towards enlightenment. So I'll, I'll reiterate that one. The path, we gradually embody the meditation practice and the spiritual practice as a whole in terms of method and wisdom. The result or fruition of the path, enlightenment itself, the non-duality of perfected form or compassion and method and perfected wisdom and unified, okay? Unified wisdom and compassion, to put it simply. This is enlightenment. This is the result of the ground and the practice. We have to have a knowledge, we have to know this ground to be able to realize what we're aiming towards, the purpose of our practice, for instance, to attain enlightenment, you know? We must know this, otherwise we may go in the wrong direction. We must know how to put the Dharma into practice, how to practice the path by basing it on this foundational ground, okay? So um, realize the result or fruition of the path, which is enlightenment, the non-duality of perfected form or compassion and method, and perfected wisdom or insight. The first seven and a half verses uh, relate to the relative bodhicitta and to the form as mentioned, and to perfecting this form and developing this compassion, this method. And the last half of verse is to realize the ultimate nature of reality and the ultimate bodhicitta. Okay, so I will um, conclude, give a conclusion in a couple of weeks for this, but I think maybe next week, um, I'll continue the commentary on this verse and possibly the week after as well. We'll see how we go. Um, five parameters and the sixth parameter. It can be compared to that. So the first seven and a half verses 
I like the five parameters, the first five. And then the last half of the verse number eight is like the sixth parameter, comparing. I think, I think you can realize that. Yes. Yes. Can I move on a little bit? Yeah, thumbs up if, if I can move on. No thumbs up? <laughs> okay, good. All right, so the last two lines point to the practice of cultivating insight into the nature of reality, the wisdom of emptiness, in other words. Now, don't perceive, don't misunderstand, okay? Don't think emptiness is nothing. It's emptiness of a self, emptiness of separateness, okay? So it's very deep, very profound. Um, also Buddha nature, you can say. Emptiness is none other than Buddha nature. Buddha nature is not under, not other than emptiness, you know. They are kind of so there are two ways of explaining exactly the same thing. Okay. I was asked once by a nun um, overseas, I think in Malaysia, uh, at the airport. And she said, What's your take on which is higher? Buddha nature or emptiness teachings. I said, how can they be separate? The Buddha nature is not separate. The teachings within not separate. Then emptiness also not separate. So they are the same. Different ways to explain something very profound. Like looking at a house from the front and the back and inside and above and so on. Okay. So the last two lines point to the practice of cultivating insight into the nature of reality, the wisdom of emptiness. But on the surface, they seem to denote a way of relating to the world during the stages of post-meditation. So it seems like we're only talking about um, actually how you should practice in relation to everything you come into contact with. It's on the cushion as well, though, as well as off the cushion, to use my metaphor there. Okay, so practicing on the cushion, this is during the meditation, specifically the meditation on emptiness, and then as you go about your worldly ways, your worldly things that you engage in and people you engage with. And so um, on the surface, uh, these teachings or this, this verse seems to denote a way of relating to the world during the stages of post-meditation. In the Buddhist teachings on the ultimate nature of reality, two significant time periods are distinguished, okay? This is important to know. One, the actual meditation on emptiness. So the time that you sit on the cushion and meditate on emptiness. Then number two, the period subsequent to the meditation session when you engage actively with the world. Like I said, on the cushion and off the cushion. These two lines directly concern the way of relating to the world after one's meditation on emptiness, although they also help us to practice on the cushion. But specifically, we're talking about engaging in the world. How should we perceive everything that we come into contact with? All objects, like an illusion, but still not give up the compassion because compassion is unified with the wisdom or should be unified with the wisdom eventually. So that's why we're going to work as well to help free beings from their karma, from their unsubdued mind, you know, to help them to realize enlightenment as well. Okay, so um, these two lines, uh, reiterate, um, directly concern, uh, are concerned with the way of relating to the world after one's meditation on emptiness. This is why the text speaks of appreciating the illusion-like nature of reality, which I alluded to just now, because this is the way one perceives things when one arises from single-pointed meditation on emptiness. Now, often people think that what really matters is single-pointed meditation on the cushion, on emptiness, on the cushion within the meditation session. This is really important, of course, but also a lot of our time is spent off the cushion, isn't it? So we should take this understanding, this perception of emptiness, you could say, with us, okay? So that we can develop more compassion, be less self-centered. Um, so I'll, I'll repeat that. Often people think that what really matters is single-pointed meditation on emptiness on the cushion within the meditation session. But the post-meditation period is very, very important. 
because like I just mentioned, it's probably most of our time, okay? But often people pay much less attention to how this experience should be applied in post meditation period, okay? We pay less attention to it. So then we can fall back into our old habits, isn't it? Get attached to things, you know? Think about ourselves, put ourselves above others, you know, rather than perceiving things from a mind of equanimity, right? The whole point of meditating on the ultimate nature of reality is to ensure that you do not, you're not fooled by appearances and then start to cling to them, grasp at them. Okay. That can often be um, the way it is, you know, because it's our habit to do so, to be confused, to be confused by uh, things that we're attached to, as well as those things we have an aversion for and all other things too. So I will repeat that. The whole point of meditating on the ultimate nature of reality is to ensure that you do not, or you are not fooled by appearances um, that can ob obviously be um, sort of defiled. Our mind becomes defiled at that time um, because it's based on delusion, based on ignorance. And we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. With a deeper understanding of reality, you can go beyond appearances and relate to the world in a more appropriate, effective, and realistic way. So once again, I'm repeating some of these verses that I've written um, for your benefit, so you can remember them, okay? And I can't think of better ways and um, to, to express them right now than what I read, okay? So um, if I do, I will give more commentary over time this week. Uh, for the, the next one minute and 20 seconds and also next week and so on, okay? But right now, I, I'm happy with the way these sound. With a deeper understanding of reality, you can go beyond appearances and relate to the world in a more appropriate, effective, and realistic way. With a deeper understanding of the nature of reality, when we are in post-meditation periods, when we actually engage with the world, we will relate to people and things in a much more appropriate and realistic manner. I think that's very obvious to, to see, isn't it? So you should review this class again when you get time on YouTube um, or on the Facebook, uh, post it on Facebook later, as well as upload it to the YouTube channel later as well. Um, so I will give an example next week, uh, once again, of my everything song. Everything is like a flicker of a lamp and so on. It's like an illusion, like the verse says. So I rejoice in your goodness and your participation. I'm going to go for a walk now because the sun is staying, it's staying light longer into the evenings. So then I'll eat something later. Okay, take care, practice well. Smile, inner smile, outer smile. <laughs>